Hello and welcome to Global. I'm Tim Wilcox. Let's just remind you of that uh, breaking news in the past. Uh, uh, a uh, reporter and cameraman shot dead in the town of Moneta in Virginia. As we speak, there's an ongoing manhunt for the shooter and uh, reporters and staff at the TV station, an affiliate of uh, CBS, uh, have been ordered to stay in the offices and studios until further notice. We'll be bringing you the latest pictures uh, and indeed reaction from that. Meanwhile, uh, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has appealed for calm in his home state of Gujarat after a night of violence left at least three people dead. Police and paramilitary squads tried to quell riots and a curfew has been imposed in several areas after members of the influential Patel community demanded the special status already given to other castes. Cars and buses were torched, stones thrown as Patel caste members clashed with police and people from other groups of OBCs, or as they're known, other backward classes. Well, the clashes broke out over the detention late on Tuesday of the Patel protesters' leader, Hardik Patel. The 22-year-old had led a massive rally in Ahmedabad. The BBC spoke to him before that rally took place. <laughs> We just lit the first spark and then the fire spread on its own. It has reached every village and town in Gujarat. It has reached every district and every home. Just 5 to 10 percent of people in the Patel community are prosperous. That does not make the entire community rich. If you visit a village home in the Saurashtra region, you will see people do not have enough to eat. There are so many poor people. And if you look at the farmers who have killed themselves in the past 10 years, the largest numbers are from among the Patels. Most of our supporters are from 18 to 42 years old and they are facing injustices. They cannot get good degrees because of the quota system. And then they cannot get good jobs either. They are our biggest supporters. The elderly are supporting us because they are fighting for the next generation. Women are also with us in our fight. It does not matter that I am young and inexperienced. What counts is the experience of 5.2 million people who are supporting me. We are here not to uh, against any community, not to against any government, not individually. We are here to ask for our rights. That's it. We have come here for our children. We have come here for our country. We have come here for everyone. We want our right. I'm not threatening anyone, but India and Gujarat are the land of revolutionaries. We believe in peace and love and follow in the footsteps of Indian independence heroes Gandhi and Sardar Patel. But we are also inspired by revolutionaries like Chandrasekhar Azad and Bhagat Singh. And if need be, we will not hesitate to take the path of violence. We will call off our agitation only after the demands of Gujarat's 18 million Patels are accepted. Well, let's uh, speak to Dipankar Gupta, who is a sociologist and director at the Centre for Public Affairs and Critical Theory at Shiv Nala University in Delhi. Also, Rajani Bakshi, an author and the senior Gandhi Peace Fellow at the Gateway House think tank in Mumbai. Uh, Rajini Bakshi, if I can come to you first of all, it, it seems strange that for a community that represents, what, 20% of the population, that they don't have the sort of rights that other caste members have. Do you agree? Is that for me? Yes, it is. Sorry, Regini. Uh Yes, it, it does highlight, in a sense, the irony of uh, where the caste and the reservation issue has brought us today. Uh, and I think we need to look behind the anger that you're seeing on the street to hear the concern. Uh, and that concern is really about a sense of fear. It's all born out of a sense of fear. The pie is still limited. How many ways can you slice the pie and yet be fair to everyone? And uh, so I think really the challenge going forward 
is for us to introspect all over again how we define fairness in India. But that means also recognizing that caste remains a huge issue and that caste exploitation and caste discrimination are a uh, un, un, not unchanging but still a very, very painful uh, reality on the ground in India. So in that context, how do you uh, strive for fairness for all? I think that's what we need to look at today. Dipanka Gupta, do you agree or do you think that the caste system is now turning into something of an anachronism or on a normal day-to-day -day level? Well, I agree and yet I think there are some problems with uh, the way things are going right now. Because the caste system in its ideal form is a system that doesn't allow for competition. Everybody should know their place and uh, participate, if necessary, in their own subjugation. But what we see really is caste competition, which basically means that we misread caste for a very long time. Yes, it is true that there is a lot of caste discrimination, and this discrimination has been going on for centuries, and in many ways it has perhaps occluded development in our country. But what has really set the cat among the pigeons is reservations. Reservations of two kinds in our country. The first kind was initiated by the founders of the Constitution, and it was aimed at scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, particularly the untouchables and the tribal community, so-called, because they've been discriminated against for generations, for centuries. They had no assets whatsoever. Then along came Mr. Mundell and Mundell form of reservation brought in by V.P. Singh in the, late nine, in the early 1990s, and that opened up the doors to other backward classes, which is a very amorphous definition. It meant, really, anybody could claim to be other backward class, member of the other backward class, if they had the political clout to do so. Now look at the, the contrast. In the first case of reservation, it was for people who had no clout whatsoever, no asset whatsoever. The second round is for people who have assets of, of a certain kind, basically rural assets, who are politically quite powerful, and now they say that we want reservations as well, they muscle into it. So they have one kind of asset, they want to transfer that asset into another kind of asset. And the fact that we've given into this has ruined reservation system for once and for all. And that is why what we're seeing in Gujarat today, what we saw early in Rajasthan when the Gujar community wanted to be scheduled tribes because they were being ousted by the other backward classes in, in, in Rajasthan, you see this all over the place and because political leaders are complicit in this, there is no way out. There's no point in saying caste system by itself you know, has done all of this. It has not. Caste system doesn't have a logic of its own because it's difficult to predict a logic in these changing times. Okay. What has happened in fact is pol politicians have tried to take advantage of it and in many cases try to take a shortcut to power. All right, Rajini, so, so how, how do you break that that tie then to the to the caste system. I mean, is there an appetite in India to do that? Presumably amongst the lower castes, if not amongst the senior ones, who who still benefit from it. Absolutely, I think there is a movement, and one signal of it was if you uh, observe how Indian companies, many of them, because they were in fact uh, wanting to hire so many more people in the earlier phases of growth, have hired people who were not fully qualified, many of them from the so-called uh, scheduled castes or OBCs and trained them so that they were then able to take their place in the best IT companies and management companies etc. Uh, now some of that is driven by sheer need because we do need to be able to tap talent at all levels of the society. So in that sense, the best answer to all this is to grow the size of the pie so that there is, n there is not such fierce competition for restricted and limited and scarce resources. That's at one level. The other is that I think maybe too much faith has been put in the governance structure and the state providing all the answers. The, it's really at the end of the day a challenge for civil society and for us as a culture. It's true that this is a process of rebirth. We are in a transition that is unprecedented in the history of this civilization. So yes, it's bound to be turbulent, it's, it's bound to be painful. But I think the answers have to come out of civil society and we have to find ways to depolarize this discourse and to, you know, find platforms, create platforms so that people can air their fears and hear the other and find answers together. 
Uh, and Dipanka, just a final thought from you. Uh, is this linked to the sort of corruption within the bureau bureaucracy uh, of India that castes operate almost as cartels when it comes to political favours uh, and placements for jobs politically? Well, you know, I think we should be careful on that because there is no caste really that by itself dominates the scene. Uh, in this particular case, the Patels are 15% of Gujarat's population and therefore by, in terms of just numbers, they are overwhelmed by other costs. So the real issue is that how do you work out a niche for yourself? That is the more important thing. And this niche, as I told you earlier, has been provided for by the bundle commission, the other backward classes reservation. Now look, the Patels that we're talking about, they are prosperous in Gujarat. It's true, Nobody's, not everybody can be prosperous. Now, that's nothing new. They are prosperous. They control the diamond industry. They are also groundnut oil. They are prosperous in rural India and urban India. Probably the only caste in the entire country that is there in rural and urban India in equal numbers and equal power and equal heft, which is very unusual. Second, there is a break between the Leora Patels and the Karwa Patels. And this man is a Leora, Pat Leora Patel. And if you look at the background, you'll find he is consorting with people who are Leva Patels. And this group had earlier opposed Modi uh, tooth and nail around 2012. I think they see a chance again and they want to hit back. Maybe they succeed, maybe they won't. In my opinion, 15% doesn't make for an entire society, but they will do their best to try and upset Modi's apple cart and destroy his well-tended garden in Gujarat. All right. It is uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, these three people killed, though, uh, unfortunately, in those disturbances. Dipanka Gupta and Regina Bakshi, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us here on Global Today. Now, to... Uh